Welcome to Alaska Weather, a production of Alaska Public Media and the National Weather Service, Alaska Region. Produced and broadcast daily from the studios of KAKM, Alaska Weather provides complete forecasts, public, marine, and aviation for all of Alaska. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service. Good Tuesday, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service. It's the 26th of August now. As always, we encourage you to stay up to date with your latest weather information no matter what part of Alaska you're in. You can do that pretty easily by going to the website at arh.noaa.gov or more simply weather.gov slash Alaska. And once you get to that site, just click on the spot of Alaska that you're interested in or you can type it in the search bar to get your specific forecast information. You can call us on the Weather Info line at 800-472-0391. Find us on Twitter, on Facebook, as many of you have today, where we shared a picture of a, not double, but a triple rainbow. If you've never seen that happen before, it's uh, pretty special stuff, and it might be the only time you ever see one. And check it out here. We got that uh, from someone driving through the Palmer Hay Flats in South Central. Pretty neat picture there, so check that out on Facebook.com slash NWS Alaska. And on YouTube, you can get your daily afternoon map briefing around 4 o'clock there. It's uh, just a short snippet that plays really well on your phone. No matter if you're in town or out in the bush, it's a short file. That won't take up a whole lot of your bandwidth in your uh, cell phone minutes there if you like to do it that way. Or watch it on your computer, of course. Just go to NWS Anchorage or type in AKWX TV after this show and watch the complete broadcast of Alaska weather that way. Here's the weather headlines as we see them coming your way over the next couple days, uh, starting tonight and tomorrow. Small craft advisories pretty much cover the Aleutian chain, especially for Wednesday, and also for the Northwest Gulf and the Chukchi Coast there. The winds are coming up in many areas around coastal communities in Alaska. So if you're thinking about heading out to sea or leaving port tomorrow, again, make sure you check the very latest forecast before you go. A series of storms continues the rain train across a large part of Alaska. Just a very wet series of uh, Weather makers moving from west to east with a flat flow across Alaska. So we're, we're in a pretty progressive pattern right now, and that does not look to end as we go through the end of the week. And looking up north, the Beaufort Coastal Ice. that has uh, been just offshore of Prudhoe Bay and Dead Horse. So about 30 nautical miles about a week ago is shrinking ever so slightly, a little bit more, a little bit more. And it's just about gone, but not yet. We're going to take a look at that here in just a few minutes. Here's a look at the Pacific uh, satellite picture now. Here's the North Pacific and the Bering Sea, of course, and the Aleutian Chain covered up with cloud cover. You'll notice out to the west a pretty wide swath of moisture moving in from the south and west and wrapping around the circulation here south of the Kamchatka Peninsula. That is the next big weather maker moving into the Aleutians and it is pulling in quite a bit of Pacific moisture with it. Just another wave in that train that's been working its way into south and western Alaska. So you can see all that moisture working its way in from west to east. Uh, something else to note here across eastern Siberia, there's colder air dropping south and west. It's that time of the year, isn't it, folks? It looks like that colder air is going to make its way across the Bering Strait and into the Chukchi Sea coast. Probably uh, as we head into tonight and tomorrow, you're going to see a cold front on the map. Once that makes its way to the Brooks Range, it looks like as early as tomorrow night and probably lasting until Friday, there could be some snow around 1,500 feet and above in the Brooks Range, maybe one to four inches of snow there. So. We said it. We've said the S word now on the show, and that means, uh, yeah, maybe we're really into fall. If you haven't noticed already by the shrinking opportunity of the visible satellite picture, we're losing the daylight hours so much so it's impacting what we can see on the visible satellite picture, unfortunately. Looking out at southeast, some ragged cloud cover there. The moisture that's been streaming in from south and western sections of the Gulf uh, dropping a few rain showers today, but didn't really look like a whole lot as far as the observations go. Across the central gulf, a lot of dry air there. South central saw a wealth of cloud cover at times today, but not so much once you got into the Copper River Basin. The further west you went, things were really drying up. And then you get into uh, more of that southwesterly flow right off of the coastline and a little more cloud cover for you. 
Now we did have some thunderstorms firing up uh, just east of uh, Unalakleet and the Seward Peninsula. You can see that brighter white patch of cloud cover there and also across the south facing slopes of the Brooks Range earlier today. Some showers and thunderstorms noted in that general direction. One more time with a loop and you'll notice uh, also a wealth of cloud cover. This is what we're looking at with that Pacific moisture gathering up around the Aleutian chain. Uh, just a wealth of clouds across the chain. A little bit further north, yet another area of low pressure and behind that some drier air as you head into uh, the Kamchatka Peninsula and areas a little bit closer to Russia. Here's the surface features now with low pressure draped across the Brooks Range. We have warm air situated across the interior at this point. There's some showers and some light rain that we're noting around areas close to Fairbanks, not directly over Fairbanks around the 4 o'clock hour. Out to the west in the lower and middle Yukon Valley, some showers there. Another wave of low pressure west of the Pribilovs at 1,009 millibars. Out ahead of that, some areas of light rain and fog for the Pribilov Islands themselves. A trough of low pressure west of southeastern Alaska and that was allowing ridging to take place right across the southeastern part. As you get up a little bit further north, a few showers and thunderstorms are firing up, not as many as previous days, and areas of light rain and fog across the Arctic coast with high pressure up across the Beaufort Sea coast at about 1,012 millibars. That's going to scoot eastward a little bit. It's still going to be on the map, but just barely, so didn't bother putting it on there, but we've got high pressure right about here. Out to the west, though, there's the colder air we're talking about, and as that moves eastward over the next 24 hours, there's still plenty of moisture out ahead of it and at elevation around 1500 feet or above. Again, that could mean one to four inches of snow by the time we get to Friday for parts of the Brooks Range. Low pressure right over the Pribilovs at 1004 millibars is also working with some colder and drier air. Not a whole lot, but enough to draw it on the map. And as that works with Pacific moisture across the central and eastern chain, that should allow for a better chance for rainfall to continue uh, on and off in more of a light to moderate fashion, maybe a little bit heavier the further east you go toward the Alaska Peninsula. A trough working its way from southwest to north and east will bring a few showers across the Kenai Peninsula, especially the Kenai Mountains as we get into tonight. Most areas in south central look to be pretty dry at this point. For southeast, pockets of rainfall will still be possible as you get more of an onshore flow developing. As we get into Wednesday, low pressure organizes a little bit more in the western gulf at 1,000 millibars. And with that moisture coming back in pretty hard from the south and southeast, looks like there's an opportunity for some moderate to occasionally heavy rain from Kodiak into the southern and western parts of the Alaska Range and more rain falling across south central and Matanuska, uh, the Kenai Peninsula and parts of Prince William Sound. Southeastern Alaska also looking for some light to moderate rain and there's our cold front again. Now it has crossed the Bering Strait. It's reached the Chukchi Sea Coast around just about to Wainwright in fact and reaching Tin City as we get through the rest of the afternoon. It will still be a fairly mild day across the interior with temperatures in the 60s but uh, probably won't see widespread areas of heat with highs back in the 70s. There will be an opportunity for showers and thunderstorms again across the middle and upper Yukon Valley and across the south facing slopes of the Brooks Range. On the north side though, watch for a little bit more of a southerly flow. The winds are going to pick up in all areas from uh, the northwest coast all the way up to the Beaufort coast with a south and westerly direction. Looking out across the chain, uh, the central and western chain, uh, you'll notice a frontal boundary working in from the North Pacific, 1,000 millibar low there with warm air making its way to the chain itself and then colder air quickly following behind that. You'll get back into a westerly flow in not too long. Here's a look at Thursday now. Colder air is working its way across the northern part of Alaska with uh, air dropping into the lower and middle Yukon Valley. The circulation itself will probably be across the eastern Brooks Range. Most of the shower and thunderstorm activity will likely be uh, into the western sections of Yukon itself. Across the upper Yukon Valley, it may start to ring out a little bit more rainfall. A moderate to heavy rain is possible in a few cases there. There's certainly enough moisture content in the atmosphere to make that happen. And a low across the Gulf of Alaska will bring back the stronger south and southwesterly flow to parts of southeastern Alaska. And that ridge of high pressure starts to give way here. So we're going to focus probably some stronger winds across the northern Gulf Coast. So if you're in Cordova and just offshore, there could be a better opportunity for some uh, turbulence in that area. Looking across Bristol Bay, Drier air preceding the cold front will make its way across the region, so look for a little more clearing conditions there. And a frontal boundary for the central and western chain is now northward, heading toward uh, St. Paul, St. George, and the Pribilovs, with low pressure still west of Attu. We'll watch for a, an area of low pressure to develop here south of Sand Point, heading toward Kodiak as we get toward Friday and Saturday. So that will reinforce more moisture potential again as we get into the weekend. Now checking on temperatures across southeastern Alaska, you'll notice uh, most areas were in the upper 50s and lower 60s. Juneau today, lower 60s. Sitka, 56. Ketchikan and Annette, also lower 60s. 
Prince William Sound saw highs today in the upper 50s and lower 60s. Cordova about 60 there. Same goes for Seward and Homer. Kenai was pretty close to 60 degrees, lower 60s for Anchorage, Talkeetna 59. Glen Allen was 60 degrees down the road at the Matanuska Glacier, it was 54. Healy and Greeley were both in the mid 50s with Fairbanks at 61. Tanana 58. Ambler and Bettles also saw temperatures in the mid to upper 50s today. A little bit cooler out around Ambler at uh, 54. Arctic Village was 55, 57 at Fort Yukon, 30s and 40s for the Beaufort and Chukchi Seacoast there. Barrow was only 39, same for Cactovic though. Not a big change in temperatures as we sometimes see. At around Wainwright it was 41, Kivalina was showing 52, Kotzebue about the same, Shishmaref a little bit cooler at 50, Nome was 50 degrees. Unilaclete in the upper 50s, uh, Galena was showing uh, about 58 by 3 o'clock hour. Grayling, 55, Hooper Bay, and most of the YK coastline was in the mid-50s. 54 are at around Savunga and St. Lawrence Island. Once you got toward uh, Bristol Bay, temperatures were considerably warmer there, mid-60s, in fact, a good 10 degrees warmer by many cases. 62 around Kodiak, upper 50s and lower 60s for the Alaska Peninsula, Sand Point, 61. Cold Bay and Falls Pass, just shy of 60 degrees late in the day. 58 in Unalaska and Dutch Harbor. And uh, St. Paul and St. George, a little bit cooler, but not much. It's still pretty mild for your lower 50s and uh, lower to mid 50s for the central and western part of the chain. Now, overnight lows should hover in the lower 50s for the Alaska Peninsula and the chain. The YK coastline likely uh, closer to 50 degrees. Dillingham and Bristol Bay in the upper 40s. 49 around Nome. Kotzebue Sound temperatures will also go just a little bit below 50 degrees. Mid 30s for most of the uh, Arctic coast. Many areas will stay just above freezing with that south and westerly wind kicking in. Mid 40s for a good part of the middle Tananaw Valley and the upper Yukon Valley. South Central and the Matanuska Susitna Valleys should see overnight lows in the upper 40s to lower 50s, most of the Kenai Peninsula there as well. Homer probably a little cooler at 48, 51 in Kodiak and southeast in the upper 40s to lower 50s. Juneau about 51. Catch Cannon and Annette on the warmer end of that in the mid 50s, maybe even pushing the upper 50s. High temperatures tomorrow should warm into the upper 60s for a good part of the Yukon Valley. Again, uh, the YK coastline, though, probably closer to 60 degrees. You'll notice a little bit of a warmer day across the northern coast with temperatures back in the mid-40s for Barrow and Wainwright, Prudhoe Bay and Dead Horse. For the uh, interior, especially the middle Tananaw Valley, we should see highs in the mid-60s with South Central closer to 60 degrees again. Lower 60s for Southeast, Ketchikan, Annette. Heidelberg, uh, probably Petersburg, and uh, around Cloak. Look for temperatures back in the mid-60s there, though a little bit cooler than what you saw today. And upper 50s for a good part of the Alaska Peninsula and the chain in the mid-50s, with St. Paul and St. George about 56. Flying weather includes IFR conditions for the Chukchi Seacoast. No surprise with the cold front coming in. We've got moisture ahead of it. We're going to have a lot of lift, and visibilities will start to go down as the rain begins to fall and fog moves in. Watch for a few showers and thunderstorms across the central and eastern interior, again, uh, employing some poor visibility at times there. And IFR conditions from St. Matthew around the Pribilovs there by the afternoon and hugging the northern uh, coastline of the Alaska Peninsula and the Bering Sea coast there, also the eastern side of Kodiak Island and the central and western chain. Otherwise, MVFR developing for areas around Yakutat into uh, Juneau itself, probably fairly close to Gustavus and westward into the northern Gulf and the western Alaska Range. Here are your pass conditions for Anaktuvik Pass. Right now, things look to be okay, though. VFR conditions. For tomorrow, Adigan Pass, likely seeing MVFR conditions with some improvement during the day, but we're going to watch for thunderstorm development in the area. Lake Clark and Merrill Pass should also see conditions turn over toward MVFR during the day, so watch for things to change there. And for Rainy Pass, we expect to see marginal conditions develop. Windy Pass may be there for a good part of the day, from morning to the afternoon. Isabel Pass, VFR conditions trending toward MVFR, and Mentasta Pass, we expect visual flight rule through the day. Tanita Pass, MVFR conditions through most of your Wednesday. IFR conditions, at least in the morning, along Cook Inlet, and then some improvement to MVFR. A good part of the pass could be MVFR throughout the entire day. And Chilkoot and White Pass, we expect to see uh, marginal conditions throughout the day. Now for freezing levels, a colder air pocket is sitting right across the YK coastline and westward toward the St. Matthew Island waters. Those levels are below 6,000 feet. South of that, though, we see pretty rapid improvement toward warmer weather. 8, 10, even 12,000 feet hovering right over the central and eastern chain in the Alaska Peninsula. Another surge of colder air there around the western Brooks Range. But, of course, that's not the real cold that's coming, right, if we've got snow in the forecast for the Brooks Range. Icing potential above 6,000 feet there across eastern Siberia and north of the Gulf of Anadir. Also above 8,000 feet for southwest and south central Alaska around the frontal boundary across the Gulf. And above 12,000 feet way out across the west. Most of that's going to be light to isolated moderate at worst. And again, we're still watching for convection across the central interior. The jet stream shows 
trough of low pressure coming out of the polar regions and with that we get our surface cold front following that track from the north and west heading toward the Chukchi Sea Coast. Low pressure also sitting across southwest Alaska has a little bit of a reinforcing punch at the upper levels at 140 knots in the upper atmosphere. A southwesterly flow north of Haida Gwaii there coming in at 75 knots. At 9,000 feet you can see that trough is uh, working its way uh, slowly across western Alaska. Pretty good uh, parallel flow across all areas there. The bearing with wind speeds from 10, 25 to as high as 35 knots across the Chukchi Sea Coast. And southwesterly is here coming into the Wrangell St. Elias region. Winds are picking up across the interior. Not too bad just yet. As you get it to 3,000 feet, an identical flow there, uh, stacked and packed as we like to say. Uh, very light winds across uh, the northern side of that low pressure system, but considerably stronger on the western side coming over Dutch Harbor on Alaska. A southwesterly flow in the same spot and the interior winds around 10 to 15 knots coming across Kaktovik at about 15 and even stronger winds coming in across the western chain there at 45 knots. So what about turbulence? Mainly below 2,000 feet for the Chukchi Sea Coast. Some light chop expected to start up there across the western gulf and into the eastern chain and out across the western Aleutians below 4,000 feet. And again, we'll be watching for convection throughout the day across the central and eastern interior. That's a look at your aviation forecast. We'll be back with a quick peek at the ice edge, what's left of it, and of course your marine weather forecast. Stay tuned. Good evening and thanks for joining us for another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder, joined again by Eric Stevens of GINA, the Geographic Information Network of Alaska from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And Eric, thanks so much for joining us again tonight. Happy to be here, Dave. Thanks, Eric. And uh, we've been talking about the complex uh, uh, gathering of information uh, from satellites looking down on the uh, surface of the planet. And some of those orbits around the planet work for Alaska, and some of them don't. And there's a lot of challenges with those. Uh, how can we get better imagery for the poles and specifically for Alaska? Right. Well, today we're going to talk about a very interesting kind of satellite orbit that mm -hmm. has potential to be real helpful for the high latitudes, okay. especially us here in Alaska, Canadians, mm -hmm. Russians, Norwegians will all be interested in this. Mm -hmm. um, satellites are not in orbit yet. Mm -hmm. Now the future is, is uncertain, but it's possible, and if this happens, it will be wonderful huh. for Alaska. Okay. It's called the highly elliptical orbit. Oh, that it's interesting, <laughs> yeah. And okay. I think first to help our discussion, we should get back to some of Kepler's laws and, and how okay. do satellites work. Sure. Kepler's first law, an orbit of a planet around a sun or a weather satellite around the Earth mm -hmm. is not necessarily a circle, it's an ellipse. Okay. And uh, the highly elliptical orbit mm -hmm. takes advantage of this aspect. We're going to put the Earth in one of the ellipse and then stretch one of the foci of the ellipse okay. and then stretch that ellipse out real far to make it highly elliptical. And the foci is that, that bend part of the, the end of the ellipse. If you're going to stretch out a rubber band, that would be the mm -hmm. center, kind of the stretchy part. The yes. End. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And then um, Kepler's second law says that the closer something is to the thing that it's orbiting, mm -hmm. the faster it goes. Okay. We see this in the solar system, that Mercury flies around the sun real right. fast. Um, Jupiter, much slower. Jupiter's further away, it's mm -hmm. slower. Mercury's closer in, it's faster. This happens with weather satellites, too. Mm -hmm. Even uh, satellites like the International Space Station, it's pretty close to the Earth. It goes around the Earth in only 90 minutes. Okay. That thing is moving. It's only 250 miles away. So. How can we take advantage of these two aspects of Kepler's laws of motion uh -huh. to get better weather surveillance of Alaska? And this highly elliptical orbit is going to be the approach. So we have with us today our friendly planet Earth right. and our simulated um, satellite, the yeah. lid off of this salt so shaker here. There. Yeah. there it is. It's <laughs> shiny, it's metal, it's space worthy. And what we want to be able to do is could you have a satellite hover over over the top of the world, up over Alaska. You hmm. can't really do that. Maybe, Geostationary maybe that, satellites right? have to be over the equator. Okay. So how, how could we almost solve this? And this is, this is the tricky part. Maybe uh, should we uh, tilt the we Earth tilt over? The Earth, focus we're, on the pole, that's what we're trying to accomplish right. here, right? So okay. here we have the northern side of the planet. Mm -hmm. And we're going to trace out the orbit of a satellite with this salt shaker okay. lid here. Now imagine a highly elliptical orbit, so let's put the Earth in one of the foci of the ellipse, okay. and we'll have an imaginary foci out here. Okay. So the satellite will not go in a circle around the Earth, but will be in this long, strung out ellipse. Okay. So the satellite will go... Kind of like a racetrack. Yes, okay. there you go, like a racetrack. Okay. So it's an oval, elliptical yeah. shape like that. 
And notice now that when the satellite's over here, mm -hmm. we've got a nice view of the northern hemisphere around there's down. Alaska, okay. Russia, Canada, mm -hmm. Greenland, all there. So that's um, the ellipse aspect of an orbit, Kepler's okay. first law. The second law saying that when you're further away as a satellite, you go slower. Oh. And this we can take okay. real advantage of. Huh. Because the way this orbit works, when the satellite goes over Antarctica here, right. it's going to be close to the Earth. Okay. It's going to be moving, whoosh, mm -hmm. goes on by. And then as it comes out here, it will slow down. This oh, increases what is known as the dwell time. The satellite will just hang here looking mm -hmm. for hours at Alaska wow. and the high Arctic. And then eventually it will come around and it will accelerate and whiz around the South Pole and then mm -hmm. come back and hang here for a while because it's further away from the planet. It goes slower. Yeah. It has to. That's the laws of motion. And such like that, repeating. Wow. Now, the, the real important way to make this work is you have to have two satellites. Okay. So that while one is whipping around the pole, you've got the other one out here, and they work as a team. You could then get a series of images of Alaska that uh -huh. can be almost from a quasi, a constant frame of reference, right. and you can loop them together to make, uh, to make movies. You can take a picture every 10 minutes, say, uh -huh. of Alaska, and then loop it, uh, playing it at several frames a second. You, you can see the clouds whiz on by. You know, the Weather Channel, uh, weather broadcasters in the lower 48 especially mm -hmm. can show these movie loops from right. the geostationary satellites. In Alaska, we've never really been able to do that very well, huh. especially in the higher, most northern parts of the state, okay. because those geostationary satellites are over the equator, it's not a good view. And this highly elliptical orbit, whipping mm -hmm. around the South Pole and then dwelling up here, would be a way for us to get that constant frame of reference and do really good weather surveillance over the Arctic seeing where those storms are, where they're going. Right. Nothing quite like a, a movie loop of the weather in time to really illustrate what's important, what's going on. And compared to what we have right now, we just have small windows or snapshots of what's going on with the mm -hmm. polar orbiters. We don't have that yep. long range view that's looking top down to give us that complete motion picture that helps us understand so much of, of the atmosphere yep. at this There's point. so many different kinds of satellites. Each, each has their advantage, mm -hmm. each is important, and the highly elliptical orbit satellite will also fit into that scheme. It, yeah. It's a nifty idea to, to solve an Alaskan challenge. That's fantastic. Well, that sounds really exciting. And again, a, kind of a satellite dream of the future to come. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Thanks for joining us today, Eric. We really appreciate the information. And if you'd like to learn more about what Eric does at GINA, at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, we invite you to visit the web address that you see on your screen there. Uh, for Alaska Weather Facts, I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder. <laughs> Somebody should tell that guy the Earth is only tilted at 23 and a half degrees. It looked like more like 66 and a half, so apologies there. Here's today's sea ice edge, and this is that tiny sliver of ice that's sitting on the uh, coastal barrier islands just north and east of Prudhoe Bay. Going, 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 almost gone, might be gone tomorrow. So make sure you check in and uh, get your latest sea ice edge update right here on Alaska Weather, of course, or if you want to cheat a little bit and check out the website. You can do that by going to weather.gov slash anchored slash ice. Probably by mid-afternoon you'll have your update posted there and you can read all about it how the coastal areas of Alaska are sea ice free if only for a few days or weeks. That, uh, that's coming. Here's a look at the marine weather forecast now for southeast. Light winds across southern parts of southeast through Wednesday afternoon. Five knot winds and variable across the uh, Clarence Strait. A light onshore flow becoming variable across some of the northern entrances. Even southerlies will be light going into Yakutat at 10 knots. Across the Lynn Canal up to 20 knots with a 2 to 4 foot sea. As we get into Thursday, that diminishes to 3 feet with a southerly flow at 15 knots. Southeasterlies pick up across the central and southern parts of the inner waterways. 20 knots with a 4 foot sea. And the coastal winds start to pick up as well. 20 to 25 knots generally from the south and east. Across south central winds coming in from the south and east into Prince William Sound at 15 knots. Also across the western gulf, 15 to 20 knots. More of a southerly flow east of Kodiak Island in Shalikov Strait. That's 20 knots from the north and east. And southerlies working up the Cook Inlet at 10 to 15 knots with a 2 to 5 foot sea. By Thursday, you'll see winds uh, starting to pick up in speed a little bit more from the east across the northern part of the gulf. A easterly flow at 25 knots should bring seas up to about 9 feet. Four foot seas inside of Prince William Sound. Northeasterlies in the northern Cook Inlet. We'll have a little bit more of a southerly flow continuing across the uh, western Cook Inlet and then becoming quickly northeasterly west of the Barrens at 25 knots with a 7 to 8 foot sea. Now for the Alaska Peninsula, southeasterly is crossing Bristol Bay at 20 knots, northwesterly south of Sand Point and King Cove, 30 knots with an 11 foot sea. And then as we get into Thursday, expect more of a northwesterly shift to take place for most areas. 20 knots on the Bering side, 25 knots on the Pacific side with 9 foot seas on the Pacific and 4 to 6 foot seas 
on the bearing. Uh, checking in on the Aleutians for Wednesday, a west and northwesterly flow from Unalaska all the way down toward Atka, 20 to 30 knots there with the strongest winds from Nikolski to Unalaska, 11 foot seas there south of the eastern chain, and you'll compare that to 7 to 9 foot seas in the west and west central part of the chain, 15 to 25 knot winds there by Thursday. Winds are picking up a little bit more from the south, a 20 knot flow with a 9 foot sea. You'll see a southwesterly shift here as low pressure is lurking across the south and western bearing. Southeasterlies for Unalaska and Nikolski at 15 knots, a southerly flow on the Pacific side at 15 to 20 knots with uh, 6 to 7 foot seas there by Thursday afternoon. Across the west coast, winds are kind of light and almost a little bit variable north and west of Nunavak Island, generally around 15 knots with 4 to 5 foot seas. Northwesterly is a little bit stronger around the Pribilofs with a 7 foot sea and a 25 knot wind. By Thursday, that becomes light and variable at 10 knots with a 4 foot sea and westerlies across St. Lawrence Island at 20 knots. Now across the Arctic coast, remember that broad southwesterly flow that's feeding moisture in to some of the higher trained coastal areas. That will continue to blow about 10 to 25 knots for the Beaufort Sea coast and 25 to 30 knots across the Chukchi coast. With 4 to 6 foot seas in the Chukchi, 2 foot seas and small seas really continue through the Beaufort. Now as we get into Thursday, that flow becomes a little more westerly, probably a little more gusty as that front is working across. So watch for small craft advisories for many. Uh, westerlies for Barrow and uh, Wainwright with six foot seas and northwesterlies come in to Cape Lisbon, Point Hope and Kotzebue Sound region at 15 to 20 knots with six foot seas expected there. Recapping tonight's weather and updating you on that cold front we we're talking about. This will sweep across into the Chukchi coast as we head through tonight and into tomorrow. Watch for a better chance for rainfall across many areas in the interior. A few thunderstorms tonight, mostly across the central and eastern interior tomorrow. As the front moves into the Brooks Range and above 1,500 feet, that could mean one to four inches of snow as we go from Wednesday night and onward into Friday. Thanks for watching Alaska Weather. These forecasts are to be used for planning purposes only. Call 1 800 WX Brief for a formal pre flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service.